and welcome. We'll get one camera straight. Okay, and guys, just the pre-show sort of warm-up thing. Um, you guys are in the chat, which I can see you all in there. Um, if you just want to tell me, you can hear me. Uh, the audio levels seem okay. I had a bit of a move around today, so I can't see if things are moving, but hopefully the sound should all be okay and you're hearing me nicely. Uh, that's all coming online. Hello and welcome. We'll get one camera straight. Seems to work okay over there. Um, so yes, good evening. Uh, tonight is going to be literally about the actual paints that we use and everything else like that. First of all, excuse the reason for looking jaundice. There's a good reason why I don't film in here in the evening. It's because the sun is coming round and it's going to go drop down low and um, it's just normal blinds. Whereas behind we've got some big heavy stuff. Uh, but yeah, the sun sort of travels that way and this time of year it gets very low in here. So I have a sort of jaundice tint. So because of that, I do have a backup because you can never have enough cameras. So we've got the old fashioned camera as well. We've got the old webcam up. So that one's working. So if we need to, we can actually take that one off, put it down here for a nice close up cam as well. Uh, but as always, we've got all the other cameras running around, which I'll just have a quick check. Come on, there we go. Right, okay. So just making sure the others are all in. That's good. And we've got the close up cam. And we all seem to be about there. Volume, great. A little tin, <laughs> sorry, a little tin can muffled. Sorry. No beeps this week. I have cured that. That was me. Okay, hands up. I admit it. I'm the first one to ever admit my mistakes. That bit where I was saying last week it's you guys was me because although I muted my sound, that's all I did. I just muted my sound here, didn't mute it on there. So you could hear all the beeps coming in from me and then you were getting the echo effect from it back as well. So you're probably getting it twice. Um, so hopefully you guys have got some uh, card, uh, plastic card and all the rest of it. That will help out if you can do that uh, for spraying down on here. But basically what we're going to be doing, talking about paints, their uses and trying to get a nice, even, consistent paint finish, which is probably the sort of holy grail out of everything. Uh, and the falls on against the different uh, paints that you can use it with. So we've got a few on there. But we've got about one minute to go and then we'll get going. So good evening, Gary. Good evening, Ben. Neil. Uh, Matt, uh, who else we got? Harry, uh, Daniel, Robert, David, uh, loads of you, Steve, loads of you in the actual uh, chat tonight. Great job. Right, uh, what am I going to do? Put it on that one. Okay, what have we got? One minute out. Right, okay. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to rerun the titles and then because I'll edit this in and we'll start again. Hello and welcome to Flory Models live show. Today, again, we're going to be talking about airbrushing, the basics of it, the fours and against, and uh, their uses. Basically, last week we covered all of our airbrushes, how they work, the ins and outs of the sort of technical side of our airbrushing, uh, and explaining some of the things uh, that can go sort of right and wrong with them. We're going to continue that theme all the way through this. I'm going to be showing you why things go wrong and hopefully trying to replicate some of the problems that you guys might be having at home, as well as dispelling a lot of the myths uh, and a lot of the I suppose old school written stuff was the stuff I followed uh, when I started this off in the sort of late 90s um, or mid 90s about airbrushing. As I said last week, there was nothing about it. So I read a lot of it. And to be honest, a lot of what was written in the 70s, because that's basically a lot of those books were from, um, it doesn't really work in today's uh, modern materials that we've got down on here. So as you can see, just down in here, we have various stuff. We've got old fashioned enamel paints. Okay, so I've got some Model Master enamel black down there, and we've got some enamel thinners, which is Tamiya in this case. Okay, we've got lacquer based paints, all right? So down here we've got MRP. It is my favorite paint, bar none, of all paints at the moment, okay? And we've got some self-leveling thinners, which is exactly the carrier that's actually in this one anyway. We've also got Vallejo Model Air, which is probably my favorite acrylic for general stuff. Do love my Tamiya but uh, for sort of colors and doing things for a softer finish, shall we say, we've got that. And I've got some airbrush thinner, which I still think is probably one of the best ones out there, which is for the uh, Vallejo one, as well as good old fashioned Tamiya, which I still maintain if you're new to airbrushing and you want a, a, just a straightforward, something to cut your teeth on and get used to actually spraying and airbrushing everything else, 
Tamiya paints are beautiful because you can't go wrong with 50-50 mix, okay? And we've got some Tamiya thinners. Now this is X28 in here. It's just that I prefer the bottle because it's, well, to be honest, it's an old bottle of this. And I've just tipped it into here because it's easier to use it. Usual thing as well. So we're going to be working on plastic card and spraying straight down onto this, all right? And doing it that way. Um, airbrushing, again, as we're explaining all this all the way through. But basically, I would say it doesn't matter if you're using your eye waters, your pashes, your badges, your... Um, Harder in Steambex, really, as long as they got something between preferably a 2 to a 3.5 that's what I call a really good area to be. But if you have got a 0.15 or you've got a 0.4, equally you'll be absolutely fine with those. You don't need anything really, really, you know, fine and mon monoscule and everything else. You can pay 600 quid for an airbrush and have a tiny little needle in it to do hairs with. And as I explained last week, that's great for using inks and for artists and stuff like that. But from our point of view, when you're putting through quite a heavy pigmented paint, like you're going to find in Vallejo and Tamiya and Guns and obviously with enamel paints and things, really you need a slightly bigger nozzle just to keep the flow rate otherwise it's too small and you get any type of clogginess in there which can be caused obviously by bad mixes of paint you know debris in your airbrush things like that and that is it it will stop dead you'll get a lot more clogging with the very finer ones and then the same thing if you go big if you've got like a 0.6 needle it's very hard to work that down to small effects okay you can obviously for larger areas it's absolutely brilliant but for small work and delicate work it's just a little bit too big you do something a little bit more refined but if you in between those you should really have no problem you can go through very very thin stuff to very very thick stuff okay just depending on air pressure and stuff like that so first of all the difference of paints basically enamels you know at the end of the day they were what everybody used to use back in the 70s and 80s because acrylics really weren't around properly then they were around but they weren't exactly brilliant and all the rest of it and lacquers well that was automotive world and you know to, to beyond the average sort of airbrushing so enamels, we all remember the humbral tin, let's, let's face it, we all probably cut our tape on things like that. But obviously if you're in the US, more master is probably your standard thing, uh, doing it like that. It still has its place in the hobby. You can still buy entire full color ranges of it and a lot of people still swear by it or at it, uh, everything else. The pros for it, okay, pretty easy to use. Um, you don't get the sort of stopping and starting you get with acrylics through drying problems. Uh, you tend to get a smoother paint finish as well, purely because it is a uh, an, an actual enamel paint. So by its nature, it's more oily, okay, and things like that. Downsides to it. One, drying times can be a little bit longer. That can be cured by using a better quality thinner, okay. Um, but certainly if you're going through, you know, making quite wet coats, it can take quite a while to dry. Some manufacturers of enamel paints take a lot longer. To be honest, uh, the um, extra range that Hannans do, uh, their extra enamels, they take a long time to dry, I used to find as well. Humbral, the mats tend to dry pretty quick. One of the big problems, though, is just the mess. It's the cleanup and everything that goes with it. It can be a little bit messy, a little bit um, smelly. So again, not so much problems. You've got a spray booth and things like that. If you haven't got a spray booth, then obviously you do have to worry about your environment. So always wear a respirator if you can, a high quality one at that, or certainly make sure you've got good ventilation when you're spraying, as do you with them all. But it's more important to do with these types. Lacquers, relatively new, okay. They haven't been around a really long time. I think most of us probably cut our teeth using lacquers in a, the way of probably like I did. The first couple of times we were using things like Alclad. First thing you notice with them, they stink. They are very, very strong, eye-wateringly strong, especially if you're not used to it, okay. Um, the pros to it, they spray flawlessly, purely because they are like an ink. And like we've been saying a lot through this, a lot of the airbrushes are designed to spray ink and not so much doing acrylic work and things like that, okay? But because the actual, this one, like the MRP ones, and all the lacquer base type of paints, incredibly thin. They cover extremely well. The beautiful thing about these is, is that you don't get the stopping and starting effect. In fact, I recently did a particular model. I locked off my uh, button at the back of my airbrush and I just pulled and held and I went for literally 20 minutes just spraying and mottling and doing various things like it without stopping once okay it was absolutely flawlessly accurate all the way through just filling up I just refilled and then just carried on that's the bonus to it okay downside very smelly can be a bit expensive if you're not used to using the paints as well because if you tend to over paint uh, the areas a lot of it goes airborne things like that great for doing fine detail MRP paints I do like them hard as nails no problem with it just extremely smelly can be a bit expensive okay
Then you've got your acrylics. Okay, so there is obviously true acrylics out there. Extra acrylics is a water-based one. Um, and then you've got other manufacturers who do water-based ones as well. But from my point of view, Vallejo is probably one of the easiest to start with, purely because if you're using the model air range, they are pre-thinned. I think they could do with a little bit more thinning, if I'm honest, but definitely um, it, it's just one of those things where personal choice comes into it a lot. But if you can just pick up a bottle, squirt it in your color cup and spray it, I think that really helps a lot of people out. But a few drops of various things in there, sometimes a retarder, which we'll speak about, but generally just something to thin it a little bit more can make this stuff work even better, especially in hot countries work our way through. Okay, great thing about it, relatively low smell. In fact, all the new Vallejo model airs, I'm not sure about the other ones, but all have actually a fragrance in it. And it smells like flowers. To be honest, it smells a bit like a flower shop in here after you've been spraying with it, and I don't think it's a particularly nice smell, but the rest of the family seems to quite like it, okay? Other one, obviously Tamiya. I spoke about it before. The great thing with Tamiya, I started off on this stuff, relatively World War II colours, things like that. They've got the colour range there. Modern stuff, it hasn't. That's why I moved on to Vallejo's and various other paints, purely because they don't do a full range. But the great thing about this is it's a very, very forgiving paint. It's got beautiful coverage. 50-50 uh, mix is always a good place to start with this one, and you'll be good to go with it with no problems at all. But again, they do smell, uh, and definitely the Tamiya is a bit more smelly than the actual uh, Vallejo Model Air. Now, both of these have what I describe as a very, very similar thinner to them, okay? X20A and Vallejo Airbrush Thinner, I think, are almost identical. There is very, very little to it. Now, I know you're going to get people shouting at the screen now saying, oh, they're totally different. Have you seen them? Yeah, right, okay. But from my point of view, when I squirt it in a mix and do things with it, it works exactly the same way, okay? So from my point of view, I will equally pick up some X20A or Vallejo Airbrush Thinner because both of those thin everything in the acrylic range that I've ever used, okay? And I have no problem with them whatsoever, okay? So from that point of view, you can use both of those. I'm a great believer in though, is that if you're using somebody's specific paint range, sometimes it's better to stick with their thinner because it's designed to do with it. Now we've all heard of these other ones out there and home brews and using IPAs and all the rest of it. Absolutely, if it works for you, knock yourself out. But if you're new to it, I highly recommend getting the thinner that is designed for it. So if you're doing any of the actual Vallejo range, just get their airbrush thinner. It'll work with a lot of them. Tamiya, if you can, X20A. If you're using, obviously, uh, enamels and things like that, then obviously X20. Uh, A, obviously, meaning acrylic. No A, no acrylic. Okay, uh, and that's basically about it. It is as simple as that. Now, somebody asked me a question a minute ago, and they popped up on there saying about, do they have, um, sorry, you're saying the sound is quiet? <laughs> It's quieter than last week. Right, okay, let me just try something on the fly, and then if I'm too loud, say it, and I'll turn it down. Okay, try that. Um, <coughs> this is the happy thing. But the sound is almost blurry, not sure if I also describe it. Okay, well, I'll try that one, guys. If it's still bad, I'll switch to another mic system, and we can do it like that. So let me have that. It's it's like talking into a right. Okay. Was that any better? I've just pushed it up. If it's not, I will switch mics and we'll go to a different mic. Okay. <clears throat> right. Okay. So what we're going to do, if you just let me know how the sound is then, guys, and then I'll adjust it as the fly before we get going, because as soon as we've got compressors and things running, we'll do it. Usual thing, if I can run through for the first sort of hour, then what we'll do is, after the first hour, I'll open it up, I'll answer all your questions, and show you anything that you want to know as we make our way through. Right, one question that came up, didn't make a lot of difference, still quiet. Right, okay. Try that one. Is that any better? <clears throat> testing, testing, one, two. Good from here. Is it getting louder? It should be getting louder for a lot of you. Same here, right. Right. No difference, still quiet, sound okay here. It may be then guys, it's a regional thing, uh, that some areas it's the way it squashes the sound. The further you are away, it might be doing various things to it because it's obviously, uh, uh, you know, we are doing 1080 at 60 frames and all the rest of it. Sound is almost secondary to it, but um, yes, better, thank you. Right, okay, well, we'll leave it as that. Okay, right, thank you, Tom. 
Evening buds, sound is fine too. This is weird when I've got everyone coming in from different areas. Okay, so we'll leave it like that. Great. So what we're gonna do, we're gonna actually lay down paint. Now, I'm not gonna bother with primers because we're gonna cover about priming and various primers to go over in a later show, okay? Might seem funny, but for the moment, we're just trying to get paint down onto something. Now, what we've actually done here, which is a nice little tip, if you get a little bit of um, a lacquer thinner, or enamel thinners will work equally well. If you haven't and you're just using acrylic, get acrylic, okay? And just give it a rub around your bit of plastic card you're using, okay? And what this will do is get rid of any greases or any nasties you might have on the actual area. And as you can see, this is the last week's one that I've cleaned up already, okay? But also it'll give you a nicer, better finish to spray onto, okay? Because the thing is, oils, things like that, not so much with the hot part, uh, paints, but when you're dealing with acrylics and that, they can give you obviously fingerprint marks and everything else like that. So usual thing, plastic card, Plenty of kitchen roll because you're going to need it, okay? Cotton buds if you've got them. An old brush which isn't dropping hairs, okay? Because the thing is if it's dropping hairs, it's going to get into the needle and it presses up between the nozzle and the needle and it won't shut off. If you've ever got that thing where you just can't turn the paint off, probably got hair stuck down in there. It happens, trust me, okay? Right. One thing I'm just going to do is just cover up what I've got on the other side of the bench in case I cover it in spray. <coughs> so we do it like that. Right. Okay, so first of all, mixing up your paints and your colours and everything else like that, okay? If you can, decant it. I know it is that thing, you know, I often say about, you know, do as I say, not as I do. I don't do it all the time, but if you're new and you're starting off, I highly recommend it. These little shot glasses are literally pence if you buy them in bulk. I buy them in things of a hundred, and I think they work out about a quid for a hundred. They really are very, very cheap, okay? So... What you actually have is a little cup, so you can see exactly what the paint's doing in it. If it's a bit foggy, you can't really see what's going on in there, okay? So if you've got something like that, it really does help, okay? So next up, we'll work our way through all the different ones. We'll start with the acrylics, and we'll get onto the hotter stuff later. So we just got some XF19. Now, to be honest, this bottle has been stood around for absolute ages. I haven't used it. It's about half full, uh, and to be honest, it, um, it's probably separated and been really ucky. But what I'm trying to do is recreate conditions that you guys are seeing and have got at home and things like that okay I don't know if you can see it but where I've been spinning it you can still see the level of where it's thick and thin and everything else like that all right so the first thing is you open up your bottle of paint as you can see what you want to watch out for is this crud as I call it technical term clearly around the top of the neck the thing is that is technically dried stuff the bottles aren't exactly brilliant the way they design and hold on to this because the, the squash down bit at the top pushes it and traps it and it makes it thick. The trouble is if this stuff gets into your paint, it's going to cause trouble. And that's where a lot of your stopping and starting is going to come from and everything else like that. Now what happens is, is that this isn't mixed at all, even if you shook it, it will be still down the bottom really, really thick. I don't really recommend sticking a brush in and rubbing it round because all you're going to do is grab all of this lumps around the neck and take it with you. Again, it's what we're saying, they're not exactly the best design in the world, but if you have got one of these, absolute perfect, because all you do is poke it in the hole, whiz it, okay, and we don't, it won't take tons. Okay, and then pull it up a bit, and then return it on, and it'll buzz its way round okay and we've left all the crud in there now if you haven't got one you can get them with a brush but just don't go near the edges okay then what we're going to do is just going to pour this into our color cup okay so you can have a look at the paint and what you're looking for is it to have no lumps bumps nasties and everything else like that now i know a lot of people do say about you know, you've got this trouble where you actually have uh, air bubbles and it can cause problems. My view is that the stuff's gonna get atomized. A, a bubble isn't gonna make any difference whatsoever, but some people will want to stir, other people want to shake uh, to stop getting bubbles. But I'm thinking it's gonna be atomized, so really does it matter, okay? So that's it in there. Now, a lot of people will tell you that that's unsprayable and you can't spray it out of your airbrush. I say that's rubbish, and if I just show you here, in something like this 
Okay, we're just going to grab a very little part of this because I don't want to use gallons of it. We're just going to take a little bit just like that. Okay, but people will describe this, as I said, as unsprayable because it's too thick and it needs to be thinned like milk. Okay, the thing is, that's all rubbish because a little bit of air might help. You can, but it's going to be a little bit speckly. Okay, okay, and we can do all the usual bits and pieces with it. Okay, and that is neat paint, very, very thick. Okay, and the thing is, you can actually lay down color with it. Okay, and you have no problem. The trouble with it is, though, it's going to be really, really rough and thin, but all modern paint you can spray neat. This does have its place. The great thing about spraying it neat is if you're in a situation perhaps where you're doing a wheel well, okay, a cockpit, something where it doesn't matter, it's got a lot of texture, but you want it to be a really, really quick job, this type of thing is absolutely brilliant, okay, because you won't get any runs, it dries almost instantly, it's got a bit of texture, so if you're into weathering, dry brushing, stuff like that, it's got something to grip to. I also do it neat, as you've probably seen a lot of time around canopies when I've masked up aircraft, so you don't get any bleed through or anything else like that. Subsequent coats over the top will be wet and go through. So forget the myth about you can't spray neat paint. You can, it's not a problem at all. You just need enough air pressure to do it. So if you're talking like I am now, I've locked off my compressor back here. So the maximum it's actually doing today is 40 PSI, okay? It will go up to 60, that one, but I've locked it to 40, all right? So, you know, this thing about, oh, it needs to be like milk, rubbish. You can spray any paint, any time whatsoever, okay? The only trouble is, is you can probably see down on here, it's quite speckly and it's quite rough, okay? And everything else like that. So that is the problem you're gonna get. It's not gonna be smooth, but sometimes you don't worry about smooth because all you want is block color like we've literally done just down on there, okay? So from that point of view, we've covered that one, okay? So what we're gonna do now is just make up a mix, okay? So down in here, it's a neat, no problem at all. So what we're gonna do is mix it to start with uh, roundabout sort of, I'm gonna put in to this, and obviously I'm gauging it all, but if you have got gauges on the side, you can do it. But I'm gonna put in about 30% thinners. Okay, so the thinners goes into there like this. Then we give this all a mix up. Okay, and you can look at the consistency, and I would call the consistency of that probably a single cream, certainly nothing near milk, okay? So, and that, I think, it would be a quite a nice job, and that's very quite nice. So what we do, I'll just grab this. Okay, what I'm going to do, I'll just change colour cups. Let's dig out the waste. Big old colour cup, we don't have to. So this, you can see, a lot more runny than we had before. And all we're going to do is tip a little bit of this in. Again, we won't need tons. Okay, same as we did last week, check your airflow. Okay, now my air pressure is a little bit high. So probably about halfway, and again, this is something we talk about, okay? So this is your 50-50 mix coming in just like that, and all we're going to do is just going to start down here. So pop the airflow, okay? And we're just going to pop it down, okay? And to me, that's really very, very nice. No problem at all with it. It's got good coverage. We haven't got any big wet spots or anything else like that, but it's a little bit speckly around the edge. So what we're gonna do is just up the air pressure just a little bit, okay? And we're just gonna try that again. And you might notice how we've gone a lot narrower. Okay. And we haven't got as much speckling down on there. Sorry, we're on the... Just drop that cap a bit tighter. Okay, so I don't want to knock all this flying ideally. Okay, so this first one really speckly, second one a lot not. And this is what we're talking about. We're talking to be talking a lot tonight about is that actually air pressure 
can help out, sorry, it hates spraying on white paper or any solid colors, okay? If I put my airbrush in there, it'll stop the camera from playing, okay? But basically, because this is struggling slightly, it's a little bit speckly, it's a little bit going everywhere, okay? We've increased the air pressure down below here, and what's happened is it's giving it more propellant, so it's pushed it harder, okay? So it's actually got smaller speckles because it's atomized better. Okay, and because of that, it gives you a little bit more confidence so you can actually lay down a bit more paint so you can do it a lot quicker. Okay, so when you're going in and you're spraying around and everything else like that, we can do that thing like we did last week and you have great confidence in the mix because you can see it's pretty consistent right the way through. We've got a little bit of overjob down there, which is a bit too much air, so we're just going to turn it down a bit. Okay, and then again. No problem at all. And to me, that's around about a really good mix for doing any type of painting or colouring we wanted to. So if we wanted to come in and we wanted to spray an actual an area, we can just put in a nice little colour block. Okay, literally like that, just there, just right now. And you're good. And that gives you a lot of confidence because it's no problem at all and it's got good coverage, we've got nice control, it's not stopping and starting or anything else like that and as you can see we've hardly used any paint in there as well, okay, so no problem at all. So then what happens if we make it even thinner, alright, so we're just going to double that and put in another load of paint, a little bit of a mix round. Okay, now what we need to do is empty some of this out because it's in this chamber area just here. So you will hear the difference as this comes out. It's quite thick. And then, then and if you heard it, it's suddenly got a lot easier to spray. Okay, so then what we're going to do, exactly the same, still not changing everything. We're just going to come in. And as you can see, immediately, this hasn't got as much body to it. That's because we thin the paint. Okay, and also you have to move quite quickly because it's going to cause problems because obviously you're gonna flood it. But you notice how sharp the edges are. They're nice, they're clean, they're very, very sharp. No problem at all, if I drop this right in. As you can see, it's a good, clean edge on these, whereas these other two are a little bit speckly, okay, as you go up. So if we just do a line, like we were doing before, again, when you look at the, the differences, quite speckly, a little bit of speckle going on, you get down to here, and actually that's not a bad line, all right? No problem with that at all. The trouble that we've actually got, though, is that it's got not a lot of coverage to it, okay? It's not exactly brilliant. It's fine, but it's not great, okay? And when we lay down color, you can see how it's pushing it just at this top area up here, and it's a little bit wet, and if we try and do coverage like we did before, you see how we're having to put down a lot and then trying to stop it getting wet so we're just trying to, and it's a little bit ripply, and it's not lovely, and it's not nice, okay? And this is because of the range we've got. We've got too thick, so it's having trouble atomizing, okay? And then we've got pretty much we're okay, but now we've got its nice sharp edges for doing detailed work, but general stuff is really wet, and it's all over the place, okay? And that's purely with the thinner. Now, the thing is, if we back off of the air pressure a little bit, okay, and then we try that again, so we just come in and we can get really, really close, okay? But the thing is, we've still got quite a thin color. It's not like a proper color going down and putting it down quite heavy. And that is the drawback, is that obviously we've thinned it. There's just not enough body to physically go through the motions of doing it and everything else like that. But as you notice, it's got good flow. It's no problem. We're not getting any stopping and starting or anything else like that. It's actually working really well, okay? So this is the trouble. So what you might want to do is just come back and add a little bit more normal paint to this, okay? So we've thickened this up with the original sort of 30% type of thinners in here, okay? Then we'll blow this through again. We get the paint coming through. Okay, now I'm not going to change the air pressure, but we're just going to try that again. Okay, we all in there. There we go. All right, so we're just going to try that again. Uh, 
okay? And immediately you might be able to see it's just a little bit speckly again. That's because it's having trouble atomizing, all right? So we're just gonna add a little bit of air pressure. Okay, and as you can see, we're sort of getting back there again now. It's giving through decent color with not much fading off on the edges, okay? And this is the thing, what we're trying to do here is balance. Okay, and it's just balancing between the right type of air pressure. And all the time, I'm not looking at the consistency too much. We're not talking percentages. We're just playing with the mixture, okay, and just understanding why it is. So if you're getting speckly, really, it's having trouble atomizing. So you have two options. Up the air pressure, that will increase your atomization rate, and it should make it go. The trouble with that is, though, is obviously, you know, you've got a lot more air coming off. You're going to get a lot more sort of overspray and everything else, okay? Your other option is to thin it. Now, you want to be thinning it gradually until you get to that balance point where it's got good enough to coverage. So you're going to get the good coverage, and it's going to do what it needs to do. But you're not in that situation where it's so thin, it's either going watery, like down in here, which just looks quite horrible now. It's drying off, as you can see. Okay, it's got patches and all the rest of it. It's because it's just too thin. It's got no bite to it either. When you look at the other two, we've got this one over here. And even when we were spraying neat, you can see great coverage with that one. Okay, but that is the trouble. It's, it's just trying to find that right balance between them all. Okay, your third variable is obviously distance. Okay, so this is it. Air pressure, paint mix and distance. Okay, when you're coming in with distance, obviously if you're shooting from up here, Really, we're doing nothing. But if we just move down and get closer, you can see we've suddenly become right in. Up here, nothing, hardly anything coming out whatsoever. But again, you move in, suddenly we get in. And the closer we move in, it's actually good. So again, it's just finding the distance as well. So what you want to be doing is, is playing with your mixture. And from the back, you can think, right, OK, I've hardly got anything showing here. We need to move a little bit closer and get right in onto it, OK? So from that point of view, what you want to be doing is literally just listening to your paint, looking at your flood pattern. And between looking and listening at it, you can understand what's going on, OK? So by listening to it, if it's sounding crackly, we spoke about last week, if it's sounding rough, it's sounding like it's just spitting, then it's too thick, okay? So up your air pressure or thin it, okay? Then the other way of looking at it is, if you've got hardly any coverage, all right, then you can move in, okay? And you can move in a lot closer, okay? And the thinner your paint is, the closer you can get with limited speckling and everything else like that. Now, a lot of people say about this thing about, you know, this is literally a quarter pull on the trigger here, and we can go right down and do silly little things get this in come on camera we're being very slow today okay but down in here if i just show you on the other side all right so we've got this little guy down in here but again you're coming along and you're thinking okay let's get right down and do tiny little hairs because everybody wants to do tiny little thin hairs okay and you can put it down to almost nothing okay but the thing is from what we want to do we just need consistency we want nice flow of paint Okay, so distance wise, I'm probably around about two and a half, three centimeters away. Okay, and it enables me to come in and do just what we need to do with all of this with no real hassles and problems. Let me bring out the back a little bit there. Okay, and then obviously, for a coloring point of view, for backfilling, we're going to be coming in a little bit closer and we're just going to build up the areas very, very lightly. Okay, so we're just dusting on a little bit first. Okay, and then what we're going to do is just going to add. Now we've got a coat of paint. You often hear me talking about, you know, putting a dusty coat down. It's got something to bite to now. Okay, the other question is pattern. Should I be going left or right or squiggling or anything else? Depends on the type of effect you want. If you want it to have it, you know, quite spotty and things like that, then I say the circle way is probably the best. Okay, but. Once you've got a bit down there, it doesn't really matter because you're just going to be blowing it all in. Okay. I'm just going to get this now because it's nice. And then a final pass, just making it smooth right the way over. So you've got something like that. I'll catch it in the light. There we go. You see, it's quite wet. Okay. But if we dry it back, catch on our light. Come on. Need some shadows around here. It will dry in absolutely fine. Okay. Okay, and then what you 
you do for the final one, just a little dusty one right the way over. That just gives you a nice smooth type of satin finish to it and all the rest of it. Okay, so pretty straightforward on that one, all right? Now the thing is, all of this, I know it's a lot to take in, but what I'm trying to explain is that there's almost two ways of doing things, okay? So you've got that thing where you're thinking, right, okay, so my paint mix doesn't have to be 100%. You do not need to make it an exact ratio. This thing where you'll hear people and they'll say it needs to be 60% this, 70% that, and all the rest of it, great. In here, to be honest, it's hot. I mean, I've got the computer running at full tilt over there doing this. I can't have the windows open because it's too noisy or we're getting blowing through here. The doors are all shut. It's hot, okay? But so the thing is, you think, well, that would affect it. But it's only little effects that are going to make it. So what you could do with that, you think it was very dry in here, you know, and hot, add a little bit more thinners to it. Trouble is, though, you're going to thin the paint. It means it's going to give less, less coverage, okay? One way around that we spoke about before is you can use retarders, stuff like that. If you're in a condition where it's really, really hot, zero humidity, then a retarder will definitely help. A couple of options we spoke about before. Obviously, you've got your flow improvers for acrylics, and obviously, we've got this stuff as well, which is a retarder medium. Again, it's Vallejo, it's pretty good stuff, uh, and everything else. It's not always necessary, though. Don't automatically think, oh, thin it and retarders and everything else. Just try a few things with your airbrush first, just to see how it's getting on, okay? So, from the point of view, recapping, speckly, crackly airbrush, up your air pressure. Still not really getting there, add a bit more thinners, okay? No problem at all. You've added a little bit more thinners, drop your air pressure a little bit and move closer, okay? Because the more you thin, the closer you need to be to get that coverage, because without it, you're not gonna be getting you know enough paint down to physically do it, or you will, but it'll be so wet, everything will be soggy and horrible and all the rest of it. And this is drying off really nicely down here, but you can probably see it's, it's quite a satin finish on this one. We can catch it in the light. Hopefully, come on, I've got to be a light source here somewhere. You think I do all the reviews all day long and I can find them. Okay. Somewhere, there we go, a little bit. Okay, but it is a flat paint and all the rest of it. Okay. So yeah, it's just one of those things with this one, just listening to your airbrush, learning exactly what's going on, and then using it in that way, okay? So from that point of view, you'll be good to go. But the thing is, what you wanna do is practice on plastic art like this, because again, if you can do it on this, it's great, because then as it goes through and you move on to more technical things, everything is magnified a hundred times. We're saying like down here, this is a Spitfire wing size, you know, and these swirls we do, it would be bigger than your model, okay? So this is the great thing about this, is that if you're in, and you're doing this, so I just need to adjust my trigger a tiny bit, okay, but uh, you know, that's what it is, but the thing is, paint, I'm, what I'm waiting for this to do is thicken up in the colour cut, because I want it to start spitting ideally, okay, but the thing is, you're just coming in, and again, just checking, seeing what's going on, to me, a little bit wet, got a little bit of things in there. So, you know, from my point of view, I'm thinking, yeah, but I've got a good flow with it. It's a balancing act, okay? So if on something like that, you might think, okay, well, look, let's just try and go over that again. Okay, and we're just gonna run over the same course as we did before, clearly not as well. Okay, no problem. It's to say, it's. I'm hoping this is gonna clear, clog up a bit. But again, the other thing to remember is, especially with acrylics, all the time it's sitting in your color cup, it's evaporating and it's drying and it's getting thicker. Okay, and as it gets thicker, that's gonna affect things as well. You're gonna get that thing where you might need to, as you're spraying your model and your color is obviously you know, thickening up in here, just upping your air pressure just a fraction. And that's what we're saying about having a little Mac valve. If it's fitted to your airbrush on the stem at the front, one down in here, just on the fly, just up it a tiny bit. And that's the nice thing, you've got that little bit of finite control just down here, just to make a little difference, and that can keep everything going, okay? But the other thing as well, a lot of people say to me is about, oh, my airbrush, it's stopping and starting, and it just gives up and all the rest of it. A lot of that is, is mixing your paint, okay? Getting a nice mix of paint, a good solid mix, mixing your paint with a mixer, getting in there with a brush, mixing it well with the thinners, so when it's sat in here, it's doing the same thing. Thing to remember is it's sitting in here, what can happen is obviously the heavier particles, the paint, will then drop south and then obviously end up down here whilst your thinner is at the top, all right? Again, a really good mix of your paint will delay that from happening, but if you're just giving it a quick shake and chucked it in, 
it's not going to work as well. So it's something else to think about. So nine times out of 10, I would say if you've got that thing where it's stopping and starting and you're constantly coming over to your paper towel and you're blowing it all out and everything else like that, then putting it down, honestly, it's probably your paint mix. Something small, tiny, like we had last week, gets down the business end, blocks it up. You've just got to blow it out and try and get it out. Sometimes it quick blow on your paper towel, gets rid of it. If it doesn't, it can take a little bit more. The other thing you can do is just to take a little bit of thinners, okay, and just knock a little bit on, is that gonna stay, should do, onto a Q-tip or your cotton bud, okay, and then all you do is just gently brush the actual needle downwards, obviously away from it, if you've got an open top, if you've got the other one, you can just place it and gently turn around, okay, and just clean it off, okay, because sometimes you can get particles and they'll dry physically on your needle. As soon as they start drying on your needle, everything wants to stick to it and it affects your spray pattern. Nice clean needle, nice clean spray pattern as well, okay. So from that point of view, you just want to make sure every now and again, it's really nice, clean your nozzle, your needle, if you've got a pinch clean, it's a doll because you just pinch it, okay. But just getting in there, then again, and just laying down, okay. We're just literally trying to see if we can get anything to go slightly wrong here, but we seem to be. So, again, we're just going to colour through. You can see we've got no problems with the paint stopping, starting, not wanting to flow. Don't get me wrong, I am making small little adjustments to the trigger pull because when it looks a little bit wet, you don't, you know, obviously want to be doing that. But that's the other thing as well. When you're pulling your trigger, just start off quite small, come in. Don't be pulling in there all the way. You know, it's it's a finite thing. It's something that is just so adjustable that, you know, you can't teach people where to put it and how to use it. It's one of those things, you sort of memory muscle action and all the rest of it as you're going through with it. So don't worry about it too much to start with. It's something you sort of learn, it's a technique, and you can go through it and literally just do it like that. But again, we're down to hardly any paint here, spraying it around to say it's warm, I'm starting to sweat in here, no problem. So again, just tiny little bit of a pull and we're just gonna go down and we're just gonna see what we can do. And this, again, it's not a, a new uh, bottle of paint. This isn't new. This is all old stuff. It's just my airbrush had a clean, admittedly, before we came live on air. But you know, it is my old one. So yeah, it's uh, very much like that. Well, seeing as that's not going to stop on me, as I was sort of hoping. Okay. But again, just in these areas. And the thing is, if you're going in and you're making it too wet and you're pulling too much, stop. Okay, it looks wet, it looking like it's about to flood, just move away from it, let it dry naturally, self-level itself out and come away, then go back in. Then up here, if it had a dry, then you can come in with another subsequent quote, or coat even, and then just pop it down on top. Okay, right the way around, all the way around. Okay, and the thing is, if it's looking wet when you're up close, back off a little bit, come out of the actual zone a little bit, and go through, and there we go, we finish that colour cut. So very, very easy to use, okay, and to do when you're spraying with an acrylic. The Tamiya acrylics, again, I think they're probably the easiest or one of the easiest certainly to cut your teeth with because you start off with this sort of 30, 50, 50 mix, things like that. It's pretty forgiving. It doesn't seem to matter about needle sizes or anything else like that. It just tends to tend to perform equally well every single time, all right? So usual thing, I'll use some of their thinners, okay, thinners in. We just do a very quick color change. So it just gets a brush round. As we said last week, okay, we're just gonna tip the first one. This is because in case, just recapping, if you've got anything around the top that's dry since you've been spraying, if you blow it through, it sucks it down and then takes it into all the business end of your airbrush and gives you all the troubles. Then you can just give it a bit of a wipe round and then hopefully you can see it's exactly what we were talking about. We've got the dried crud on the side just down there. So the thing is, if you're scraping this all round and then it goes down into your actual airbrush, okay, then what's going to happen is it's going to kind of cause jamming, stopping, starting, and all those things. So even though I rubbed it out, some parts might have dropped down the business end. So what we'll do 
We just pick this up, reflush, pop it down in there, and then all we do, we give it a whiz with a, a brush and we'll tip it. Okay, then you come in and just do a quick, we'll do it on here. And you're looking to see what's coming out. It should be clear. Okay, and that little last bit when you're spraying, you also want clear. If you get a little puff, as I call it, of colour, keep going, because you've still got stuff going on down there. But it's nice, it's clean, you're good to go. You can move on with the next one. Okay, so, because I need that to dry. Right. Vallejo, classic example on this one. As we can see, this one's going to do it. This was a brand new bottle last week, admittedly, but this week, as you can see, we've got rubbish all around the end. Again, if you was to squirt this, you only need a tiny little bit of this hard stuff, like this, lovely little crusty bit, to get in your airbrush through your colour cup and all the rest of it, and that will cause no end of trouble. Now, the trouble with the dropper design like these is that they are prone to it everywhere. Okay, so I highly recommend although I don't do myself, but literally is to pull the top off. Okay, so what we're going to do, we'll give this a shake first, just to wake this up a little bit. Okay, and then take the top off with the Vallejos. Then you can do, I don't think I've got here, but we speak about this a lot. Uh, fix things. Here we go. Get yourself a, a bag of these, okay, which are M5 marine grade stainless steel nuts, okay. So you can buy a bag literally like that for nothing, but this is a M5 marine grade stainless steel. Marine grade means it isn't going to rust in here. And then all we do, we take this little guy and we drop him in, okay. You will need your end bit on here, pop him in, and then you've got yourself an agitator. Now, don't think about putting the stainless steel ball in here because if you do, it will get stuck down the business end, okay, of the actual dropper. So you try and squirt it when it's at this end and it blocks it and it blows the end off. I know I did it, okay? So what I suggest is take the end off and then again, just for good practice and making sure, we're going to pour a little bit in. Okay, just pop the tops on. Okay, now this will work just the same as the Tamiya, but it's not quite as thick. Okay, so from this point of view, we're just going to pour this straight in here, and we're going to do the same. Okay, so straight in, as we did before. Where are you guys? I can use the camera with that one's coming a little bit tight. There we go. <clears throat> okay, so this guy here, again, beautiful smell. Straight off the bat, you can see we can get in a lot closer. Okay, no problems with it at all. Okay, it's a little bit speckly, but that's what we're saying. It needs to be thinned a little bit purely because it's got a little bit of speckle. The reason we know it needs thinning and it doesn't need more air pressure is because I'm almost touching the paper. Okay, or in this case, the plastic card. But this is me literally just on top of the plastic card, and it's actually really nice. It's just a tiny bit speckly. Okay, if we start to pull on the trigger as we go around, you can see this is laying down really thick, really very nice color. And then it's got great coverage. And this is what we're saying about their paint, straight off the bat, unthinned, but you might notice around it, see how speckly it is? It's just a little bit, you know, not exactly brilliant. So again, what we're gonna do is, we've hardly got any in here, so we're just gonna take a drop, okay? As thin as down in here. Grab a different brush. Hoping I think it was on that brush. Okay, and then just blow through. Okay, and then we just redo that again. And now we've got a smoother, no real lines on it or anything else like that. A lot nicer. That's just literally a drop in that. And it's probably again made it like a 30% thinner added to the paint. But same thing again. Now it's a little bit thinner. We go in, but we notice now we can actually knock back the air pressure just a little bit and we can move closer, which will give us less overspray because we are physically closer to it. That cone thing we was on about last week, so we can just come in, 
a little bit wet, but it's all right. It's controllable. Okay, and then same thing again. You can go right in and do great things with it. All right, but again, it's listening to it, learning what it is, seeing the limitations of the actual the actual paint as you're putting it down and working your way through it. Okay, so from that point of view. The layouts are really easy, very, very forgiving. But again, a lot of the trouble, I hear it all the time, people say stops and starts. It's got this, it's got that, it's got the other. Trust me, probably you've got crud getting into the business end of your airbrush, causing troubles and everything else like that. So again, it's just one of those things where you're just laying down color generally. You can see it's a little bit speckly, so we're just going to up the air pressure. And we get a far nicer flow. And to be honest, this actually smells quite nice. It's got a floral tint to it, so it's not as bad as it used to be and everything else like that. But it's personal choices if you want to go through the ways of it. But forget this thing about mixing like milk, okay? Have a go with it, see what you get, see what effects you've got and everything else. If you're just painting a block of something, that's fair enough. But we're talking about getting a little bit closer, perhaps making some nice lines, things like that, uh, and everything else. So from that point of view, you can just use these straight out of the bottle, basically, and get in there. Okay, so the Leos actually are pretty good paint. I do recommend them when we do the courses here and people say about it. As I usually say, cut your teeth on Tamiya, next step will go Vallejo because it is just a really nice paint to use. It gives a nice control. And again, if you understand it and you know why some of those problems, why is it, you know, spitty as hell? Okay, right, this is where the retarder comes in. You can literally put a drop of the retarder into any of their acrylic paints. Works lovely. It just makes the paint more slippery. Okay, so it just gives it that more wet look uh, and goes down. But don't forget, all the time you're adding this, you're thinning the paint. Okay, so you're actually taking some of that body out of the paint. It's going to make it a little bit thinner. You might have to put on a few more coats to get better co coverage of that. Okay, so what we'll do, we'll just finish this guy off. I'm still waiting for one of them to cough. Okay, but generally, and again, just shadings and anything else like that, you can blend. There we shade around here. Let's just use some of this up. Okay. So it is that thing where people talk about, you know, and they're not too sure about whilst things are happening and everything else. What we're trying to get across in this is to show you why things happen, why it does it and everything else. OK, so from that point of view, as I say again, it is just that thing where you can actually just understand it, know it, adjust it, change it and everything on the fly. So you're not even thinking it anymore. You're not thinking, why is it on speckly? You don't do that. You just up the air pressure. Okay, not working still. That's had a little bit thinner. Okay, stopping and starting could be I've got a really bad mix of paint. Sometimes we did it last week, dump it, start fresh, clean out your, your airbrush, just start fresh. There's no point fighting with it if it's continuously going to give you problems and like stress you out and things like that. Also, thicknesses of the paint. If it's really thin, that's not a problem. It's just going to have to put a lot more coats down to get the coverage. Okay, so if you've got a thin paint, okay you just don't want to over wet it because as soon as it gets wet and it gets slippery and you get sort of you know the flood type of thing happens okay you can push it through and you can get as hard as you like as long as you have good control so like there where we've just flooded that spot you can catch it in one of the lights i don't know if i've got no shadows today it's because of obviously multiple light angles there we go there's one coming in but you can probably see it's really really wet there we go okay as you can see, that's soaked, nice and reflective with the LEDs, but it's got great coverage. Again, leave it, just walk away from it, or from a high, just air, just dry it down in situ. But the thing is, as soon as you come along and you get in here and you try and dry this and you do this, you've torn it, okay? Because that's really hard to come back from now because you've got little tears in the actual paint where you've broken it. And then God forbid you do things like this. Okay, so it is that thing where, you know, understand it, know it, walk away from it, leave it. If you'd left it, it would have been no problem at all. It would have just dried thick and gone down. Then what you can do over the tops, come in with a little dusty coat and put it down just like that. Okay. Right. So enamels. Right. I've got a good demo for this one. Uh, brush. Okay. So same thing again. Dump it rather than going through. 
Okay, so we'll clear up the side of that one. Okay. Okay, so enamel paints, classic example here, we'll just show you the difference between enamels, lacquers and acrylic, okay? So if you've got an acrylic thinner, okay, let's turn me up, so, and you put it down onto your, your little mat, okay, so it's down here, we're going to clean this off, you can put it on, as you can see, we start to eat through it, but it's not doing too much. Okay, and that is thinners on there. So you think you're not going to eat right the way through and it's blurring it through. A lot of it is because it's in the texture of the actual paint now and everything else. So it's damn near impossible to get this stuff off. Okay, so then you think, okay, we're going to come in a little bit of X28. Okay, so just put a little puddle there. Okay, and then we'll give this a rub. And again, it does very, very little. It's doing, but it's not doing it exactly easy. Okay, that's enamels. Stinks. Not nice. Okay. Slippery, smells oily. Okay. Then, self leveling. This is lack of thinners. Okay. Fresh bit of towel. Okay. Oh, look. Ease. This is what I describe as a hot product. There's a good reason I call it a hot product because this stuff melts through absolutely everything. Okay. And this is the thing with lacquer based products. They are very, very, you know, hot and they will clean and they will melt plastic and everything else like that. And it stinks as well. Okay. But that is the thing with it. Beautifully clean. Okay. So that is really your differences between enamels it's this thing enamels doesn't like acrylics and that's why you can get rid get away with using things like um vallejo mig um you know everybody else's ak uh, interactives enamel washes it doesn't affect your acrylic paint because it won't eat into it lacquers eat through everything doesn't matter what it is it'll eat through the lot that's why we say about lacquer paints are particularly harsh and a bit nasty okay so down here we've got model master enamel paints okay Give it off even. See, this is, to be honest, the trouble with their paint. You can see it's. Let's move this this way. On here. Okay. This is a new one, by the way. <laughs> so, same thing. Chances are this is really thick and gloopy down below. So, I'm just going to have a feel. And it is. Okay. So, that's pretty thick and and gooey down there. It's a nice, good, strong, thick colour though. This isn't thin like your, uh, you know, your acrylics. Okay. So what we'll do is, we're just going to decant a little bit down into here. I learned that from Hans. Can't take credit for doing that. The, hip, the cocktail stick trick. Because I must admit, I learned it off of him. See, look, I can't get the lid on. Right, note to self, put the lid on later. Okay, but you can see this is a lot thicker. This is like treacle. It's not like we were using before. You can see how it covers the cup. Okay, it's a lot, lot thicker. So this actually needs an entire new type of thinning. Okay, because your normal sort of thinning on this isn't going to cut it. Again, trying to spray this neat probably isn't going to cut it either. You could, but you'd have to be incredibly high air pressure to get this to go. All right. So what we're going to do, we're going to same again. We're going to come in with about 30% thinners. And I've got to try and find a clean brush. This one. Okay. So enamel thinners into enamel paints. Okay, and then we're just going to look at it on the side, and we're looking for smooth. Okay, 
right, okay. Get rid of that. And then what we're going to do is we're going to grab this and we're going to fit this in here. Okay, same as we do with all the others, we'll just check our flow. Okay, so right off the bat, I haven't done this for, to be honest, ages. So what we're going to do, we're just going to do exactly what we've done with all the others. We're just going to poke this in just to see what we've got. Okay, so we're just going to have a look down, see how this is going on and seeing what we're thinking. Okay, so right off the bat with this, we can see that actually it's not too bad. Okay, it's got quite sharp edges. We've got a little bit of push into the sides when we're on the corners, so it may be a little bit thin. Okay, but we do not have any real speckling at all. We did at the very beginning, but then that's because we're too far away. And as we moved in closer, it started to get a little bit more in focus as we're working our way down in there. Okay, so what we're going to do, just do a few more. Okay, it's not too bad at all. But actually, not a bad mix right off the bat. So about 30% just down into here. Air pressure, I don't know, it's what's working. Again, don't try and do this thing of finding what air pressures are. It's just what is working best. So if we up the, uh, sorry, down the air pressure, just to start, see what happens. You can see, speckly. No good, that's not enough air. So we're going to up the air pressure, and this time we're going to up it right up. Okay, and now if you look at it, you can see it's got like a, a faded edge on the edges. That's because the air pressure is too high now, so the actual atomization is just too much for it. So if you got in too close, we'd end up with this thing where we get like a canal effect, where it's physically pushing the actual paint to the side. So that means the air pressure is too high. So we're looking for Goldilocks zone. Okay, so we're just going to come in. Okay, again, it's too faded, so too much air, a little bit off, and there we go. So you find what works best, so it's a case of, we know it's quite a good mix because it's covering really well, all right? So from that point of view, we don't really have a problem with it. So we just needed to adjust the airflow until we got a good mix. Now we've got a good mix down on here, we should be able to start painting, okay? So again, probably a little bit too much on the air, so we're just going to knock the air back just a little bit, so we can get in nice and close. And just trying to build up a nice coat in there. Now the thing is, I'll be honest with you, this stuff absolutely stinks, and I'm in here with nothing open and no air thing running either. It smells quite intense. It's quite it smells dusty, okay, and everything else. The paint itself, I don't think, is too much of a problem at all, but if you were using it, obviously you aren't going to want to have everything on and open and everything else like that, okay? But generally, there's nothing wrong with enamels. They seem to be old school, but to be honest, they work. It's just that from a nicer point of view, an easy cleanup, stuff like that, then acrylic is obviously a lot easier. If you leave acrylics in your airbrush, I've done it, weeks, come back, and it's like a brick, with an acrylic, within half an hour, and operational again. And the enamel is going to need to be soaked to soak this stuff off, to soften it, to get it all out as well. So that's another negative thing really for it. But general using the paint is no difference. It's just this thing, right? We're just getting the right mix. We're doing around about 30%, probably thicker than everything you've heard before. But we're laying down nice coverage and everything else like that. The other thing to take into effect as well is obviously distance and texture. Okay, so from that point of view, when you're doing something like on here, all right, so if you're spraying, all right, and we're, you know, we're same close distance, okay, but as we, we're going to walk our way down the page and we're pulling away, yeah, great, but the thing is, this has got loads of texture to it, I don't know if you can see, but this has gone from being glossy down that end to being flat up here, so if we go in nice and tight, and we're not flooding, but we are making it nice and wet, Okay, and then what we're going to do is I'm just pulling my arm away as we're making our way back. Now a lot of people talk about texture, and I'm increasing the flow rate just so you can see it. Okay, this is that thing where as this dries, okay, you can see nice and wet, and as we go along there, it starts to 
just go off and that is purely because this is more textured okay and it's actually quite a, a hefty texture to it you can you see it on the flatness Richter scale as I'm calling it there wet and flat that's distance what's happening is purely because it's all the way over here it's coming out of your airbrush okay down here it's hitting it and it's in with its mates and it's like, oh, I'll rub a giant bath okay so it's all wet it's got time to self-level before it dries. Self-level, nice smooth finish. We're not talking 100% gloss here. We're just doing we're talking about a smooth finish. So as soon as you move away to it, what happens as well? Not only is the particles flying through the air, they're drying as they're tumbling and flying towards the surface. Also, the thing is, once they hit the surface, they're being dried as well. It's like being under a hair dryer. So his mate comes along. Instead of him being nice and wet and just soaking into his friend, he comes along and sticks to him and then another and then another and you end up with really a rough texture this is what happens as well a lot of you have mentioned about i get a really rough texture when i'm airbrushing what's going on nine times out of ten it's because of that it's what we call the vortex effect as well where if you've got 90 degree angles it just circles back on itself and it causes a vortex it's doubling the distance the paint's got to travel it's doubling the drying time it's doubling everything it gives you a really rough texture your other thing can be environmental which we're something we'll talk about in a few weeks time where if you're in an environment where there's lots of dust in the air and you've been sanding and you're spraying on the same bench and you don't clean it down those particles get stuck when they're airborne and when they're on the surface and can give you quite a nasty finish as well so if you're wondering why why is it just a patch really rough could be it caught something uh, and it caused you a little bit of trouble like that. So what we've got is actually it's drying back all very nice, all very good and clear, nice type of glossy paints and everything else like that. All right. So you save me cleaning that out, which I'll do in a minute. Last up, we actually have lacquers. Now lacquers don't need thinners. Okay, lacquers are like spraying ink. It's a completely different ball game to spraying normal paints and stuff like that. If you've never used lacquers before, you really have to change your way of airbrushing. I did certainly, purely because when I first started off, I was treating it like an acrylic. I was spraying way too far away, too much air. I was wasting everything. We were going through gallons of this stuff and for really no result. It's extremely um, you know, inefficient way of spraying and everything else like that, all right? So from this point of view, Everything you've sort of done perhaps in the in the past, you really have to open your mind that this is something completely different. It's not like enamels, it's certainly not like acrylics, okay? Because this stuff is ultra, ultra thin. This stuff is like an ink, okay? The big thing is, it's making sure it's well mixed, okay? You have got a couple of little ball bearings floating around in here, which usually do a pretty good job of mixing everything up. Some of their other colours, to be honest, you can see them down the back we've spoken about before. Medium sea grey, it's got pink and red in it. Who knew? Very heavy pigments. Okay, so what we do. So straightforward, no air. Remember, it's very thin, means you don't need any air whatsoever to get this thing going. Okay, so just turn that all the way off. Okay, and I've just brought it in run on with the trigger we were talking about this the other day what it is this under valve is too tight probably okay so good little tip on this one I've got run on with the airbrush okay so push down <laughs> always the way isn't it never does it when you want to but Normally, what I would say is just whip the actual air stem off the bottom, reattach it, okay, and just put a tiny little bit of super lube or something on the nipple at the tip of the air valve, like there. You see, it's running on. So, if we can, I'm just going to pop the bottom of this off. If I can get the, the air stem off. What happens is this air stem system here sometimes just gets a little bit sticky perhaps it's on the seal or something else like that or it could be it's too loose underneath so all you do is grab a little bit of super loop or needle juice or whatever you've got okay you just come along like this and just put a drop on the end and just give that a bit of a bounce and then it goes down just underneath we poke up 
Feels better. There we go. And that cures it. Just something as simple as that, okay? So again, it's one of those things. If it doesn't do it when you want it to, wait a week, okay? There we go, a lot better, okay? So, I'm still running on a little bit, so plan B. What it was, it's when we were playing with this the other day, I adjusted my settings. Underneath here, we spoke about it, this is too loose. Is when I was trying to make it do it the other day. That's it. Sorry. It's been a week since we used this airbrush. Okay, right. So, MRPs. First of all, you could do with a pipette thing. It just so happens, I have a new one just here. Okay, if you can, because this stuff is really messy, and as you'll see, it is literally like an ink. Now I'm going to take this and put a few drops in here. Okay. Hardly anything in the bottom of this. Now I'm going to put the lid on because this stuff. So if it falls over, you'll kill it, or kill yourself for doing it, okay? So, check your flow. Okay. So, coming in, exactly the same thing again. I'm thinking it's probably a little bit high air pressure. The other thing as well, when you're using these eggs, because they are literally so thin, all you want to do is half a trigger pull, never do a full trigger pull. So what you can, if you have got a lock off on the back, is physically lock it off to around about half trigger. So the easiest way is wind it all the way forward and then slowly pull it back to what you're happy with. Okay, you can unlock it and then lock it and you know you've got technically that same amount of pull every time. Okay, now here we go. So, uh, if we just make sure that's not tight. And that's what happens when you let the needle off at the end. Right, okay. Try that again. So. Okay. So we're looking at it. First thing we notice. Wrong camera. Come on. That's not one to know. We've got a little canal going in there. Thought we were. Far too much air pressure. Okay. Backing off the air pressure. Okay. We have a stop start problem on my airbrush. This is because this airbrush hasn't been used. So here we go, good one for you. We have that start stop thing going on. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to dump that in there because we know there's nothing wrong with that paint and it must be in this department. Okay, so I'm just going to grab some thinners. Okay. And then we want a brush, new brush. Okay. Okay, I'm just going to dump that color cup. Okay, quick rub in here. Maximum air pressure just to blow it out in case we can blow this out. Okay, then we're just going to refill in here, back in with the brush just in case anything's moved down in that section and we're just going to brush the tip of the needle. Okay, and then we're just going to try that again and again it's stopped and blocked so we know we've got something major going on in there so what we're going to do we just tip that thinners away. Okay, and we'll just do a quick breakdown and clean. All right, so back off. Needle, whip the needle out, check the needle. Needle's good. Got a little bit of tearing on the needle. We'll cover that in a minute. I was after one the other day, got it done. Nozzle off, nozzle is still covered. 
in thinners and everything, which is a sign that the nozzle's blocked. Okay, the other way you can test if there's fluid in the, the nozzle, and when you drag it, it's not just emptying in one, then you know you've got something going on. So if you have got a reamer, which is what we'll just do with this guy. So we just poke this little guy in here, and there it was. That was our problem. Just come out on the thumb. There's a tiny little bit of dried something that has just come out. So what we do, and there we go, draining. So pulling out, still got something in there. thing you can do is take the needle if you haven't got a reamer and just lightly poke at it. I don't know if you can see in there but we've got daylight in there now which is always a good sign. Okay so we'll just pop it back together. Flow through, colica. The thinner you're using for that particular paint class, so in our case, the blacker. Again, this isn't. Blow through that through. Okay, speed that up. Okay, try again. So that paint's probably going to go dry by now in there because it's such a small amount. So we just grab a touch more and try that again. Okay. Apologies for that, but that's what this is all about. Okay, so first of all, we will turn the air pressure right back. Okay, so try again, air pressure back. Okay, so coming in, there we go, that's more like it. Okay, so again, we've got a little bit of trenching, means it's too much air, so we're just gonna knock the air pressure back just a fraction more. settling in now there we go that's it I'm find a clean bit okay so coming in okay. again just a tiny bit too much air you can probably hear the difference in the actual air pressure it's hardly any air whatsoever coming out but you can see how good the coverage is it's got a little bit where it's quite thin and it's just learning the thing now distance and paint flow as it comes out. Okay, and again, we are probably honestly down to around about seven PSI if you were checking. Okay, and we're just trying to learn the sweet spot of this. And so it does have quite a, a far ranging one because we're just trying to find the flow of this. So we're just trying to find the right trigger amount, the right distance, and there we go. We're probably in here about here. Okay, so we can just really drop this right down. But the biggest difference is you can probably see how much difference this makes because the actual quality of the, the lines and how solid they are versus everything else, okay? 
So when you're doing scribbles and lines, it's a solid color in one pass. You don't have to do multiple passes with it. And when you're doing literally just laying down colors and things like that, it's just a case of coming in, okay? And you can move in quite close and you can very quickly color Okay, and work the way over this. There we go, we've used it all. Okay, we dry this back. Just turn this up. And that is the other difference. You can't do that with other people's paints. This is completely dry. There's nothing coming off of this whatsoever. So you know, I've got myself in paint tonight. Okay, so that is definitely your four. Finding the sweet spot and the balance spot with this, but also we've done all of that and we've still hardly used any paint whatsoever. Okay, the only trouble is my Mac valve is a little bit loose and I'm hitting it with gusto. Okay, but also the thing is with this paint, you can come in and you can really if you want to up your air pressure just a little bit, you can lay it down very, very quickly in large areas. Okay, dry it back. Again, totally dry instantly off the bat. Okay, so there we go, that is the thing with it. So it is that thing, laying down paint, your different colors, you have slightly different techniques to it. Lacquers, great, because they dry instantly. You know, from that point of view, you can do it, if you watch my replay, if you wanted to, of me doing the SU-27, I'm literally spraying a wing, holding it, then to spray the other wing, because it dries literally that quick. Also, this stuff is really, really, really strong. It just doesn't go anywhere. It is literally bulletproof, this paint. Again, a real plus for it. Downsides to it is, it's very thin. It's not as forgiving as using an acrylic. I don't think it's as easy to spray as you certainly would do a Vallejo Model Air or a Tamiya 50-50 mix, or certainly an Armour. It takes a little bit more finesse, what we were saying. You've got to be a little bit more delicate with it for you're actually putting it down, okay? But again, listening to your airbrush, let it tell you what's going on. On there, we have trouble. It's coughing, it's spitting, it's not really liking it, and all the rest of it, purely because of the way that it's putting down the actual paint. We're getting the trenches, too much pressure. It just you know, it's just pushing everything out of the way, knock it back, not enough, it's not really wanting to flow particularly nicely. So you do need to find that sort of sweet spot with it as you're making its way through. But it is that thing where you can literally, that paint there, just push through with it and have no problems at all. But it's personal choice on exactly how you want to go down with all of these. I'm hoping this guy's gone a little bit thick. Okay, so it's just popping with here. Okay, so if we just do a bit of a comparison. Okay. okay, and we'll just dry that back. Nice smooth finish. Okay. Yeah, not as good. That's the thing with it. You can't come in and then put down without getting that covered in paint. And that is the difference. So again, how do you work? How do you paint? Do you want something really quick? Very straightforward, no problems at all. Needs a little bit more of a finesse. If you want to do something with, as I say, enamels, they're great, they flow, they probably flow better than acrylics, but unfortunately, you're in that situation where you're gonna to have to wait for them to dry and all the rest of it. Personally, I still like acrylics. I think that, you know, although I love MRP paints and I think they're great and everything else like that, I still maintain that, you know, every, everything has its place, if you know what I mean. So from that point of view, I do like using the actual MRPs because they're lovely little stuff to work with and everything like that. They go down, but you can, you're always just playing with them a little bit. And obviously, and some people having trouble with, obviously, the temperature with them. Really hot countries, you might struggle with it as well because it will dry extremely quickly, okay? The other thing to think about with your painting is your weathering. 
If you're going to be coming in with the straightforward washes and things like that, all these paints would be great. You want to start doing things like armor, chipping, weathering. This stuff is bulletproof almost. It's really, really difficult to sort of chip into and stuff like that. Enamels, you can do it, but again, they're quite difficult. Acrylics, piece of cake, no problem. So again, what is your style of modeling? Are you into, you know, weathering and you want to do chipping effects and sort of warm paint effects? Then obviously your acrylics are going to be easier because they're more forgiving because they're a weaker type of material to work with. But again, if you just want solid heavy duty color or you post shade and you're not do doing the sort of wearing back things, then obviously go for a harder paint like the MRP. But personally, it is choices between all the different ways you want to do it, you know? So it's as simple as that. So, how are we all doing there? Flow quill really stunk. True, it did. Definitely. Didn't like that at all. Right, if you're okay with everyone, I'm just going to hit one extractor because I'm losing breath. It's a bit stinky in here. I'm covered in everything. So, I'm just going to run that for a minute. And I'll tell you, it's absolutely cooking in here. The things I do for you guys Ugh. and everything. So, what I'm going to do is. Um, we do some of the questions. Where are we? Just whilst that uh, takes a bit out of here. Crikey, it's hot. Okay, so uh, Atul says, uh, thanks, Bill. I've been following avidly. Uh, it'd be great uh, if you're able to cover and discuss the random amount of thinning to milky consistency and the effects of thickness, skinned, whole skinned, as we've discussed tonight. Don't take any notice of it. Have a thin, see what happens to it, okay? If you're just getting speckling and you can't get away from the speckly edge, all right, then add more thinner, okay? Try up in your air pressure. If you're up in your air pressure and you're pushing your paint away, lower your air pressure. Just find the balance point with the particular paint. Most paints in a range are the same consistency. So once you know roughly what you're doing, like Tamiya, I always say around about 30% thinners, is a perfect one. But you can go 50-50 if you want to do. If you want to do 50-50 and you're doing big areas, go for that, no problem at all. When you're doing lines and things, you need it a little bit more stable, shall we say. So I think that'd be a little bit easier to do it uh, from that front. Would you be able to go on making seatbelts? Ant's got that on the main site. There you go, Alan says, Ant's done it on the main site. Um, and you found it, okay. Right, uh, Jonathan, hi Phil. Um, I'll turn this off, you won't get any here. Ooh, that's better. Needs to be cleared the air a little bit. Uh, right, okay. Uh, Jonathan, uh, great idea. My biggest problem is spraying conical shapes, uh, such as cones and spinners, because they are, uh, right, uh, targeting decreases on the air. Yeah, you know, again, don't try and overcomplicate it. Um, what have I got with paint in it, which I can show? Uh, if you were doing something like my poor nose, which I'm now donating, uh, from the uh, ME262. Uh, right. Let me stick this in it. Okay, so we've got some of this black left in here. Okay, so when you're coming in and spraying it, what you want to do literally is come in, I would say, so you're sort of in this type of angle, so you're always positive to it. Okay, so from that point of view, I'm going to shoot down with pure because I don't want to cover everything. Okay, and you just, I would rotate the spinner, or in our case our nose, and just generally working it way all the way round. And I'm going to go around twice. And it's going to back up now, and we're just going a little bit more heavy. Okay, and as you can see, you've done, sorry, you've done the end already, because you're on positive, then if you needed to do the end, Okay, but technically, if you've done it like this, you would have covered it anyway. But if you did, you can just literally put a glass in the end. But that's going to dry it down a little bit. So then what I would do is you just come back and just positively do this area again. I think I've just run out of paint. Okay, so there we go. So when you're doing spinners, you just want it to sort of be like that. All right? So it is just as one pass over the entire thing. Again, don't try and overcomplicate. So literally, if you were using this as your ruler and this is your airbrush, you're always just keeping it to this. So the, the largest, flattest edge is to here. Then all I'm doing is rolling it. So you're just rolling this round and then just continuously painting on this one. Okay? And just do it like that. And it's simple as, but again, don't overcomplicate it because really you don't need to. 
Okay, uh, right. Uh, uh, Robert says, hello Phil, won't be able to watch here in the States, but hoping I can touch uh, on airbrushing uh, on small areas. I find it really difficult to have lower air pressure, uh, more paint continuing uh, with the water consistency of the paint. We sort of covered that before. If you're doing small areas, wheel wells, cockpits, stuff like that, and texture isn't so much of an issue, then actually what you can do is you can actually get right in there with neat paint and spray it, like we did with acrylics in the first uh, 10 minutes when we started, okay? Purely because it's really thick, it's not going to sort of water off in all the directions, uh, and because it's in a small area, you don't really notice that it being soft or smooth, and if you're doing little areas like cockpits, wells, things like that, they're all flat anyway, so it doesn't really matter. So that's how I get around with it. Also, as we said before, it dries really, really quickly. But again, it's all that thing about layering. If you've got very thin paint, layer it down, let it dry, put the next one on. It might take you 10 coats to get there, but you will get there. You don't need to just go in with one coat. One coat isn't everything, okay? So just take your time with it uh, and do it like that. Uh, looking forward to watching the replay this evening. Uh, thank you for you and your team and all the four members do here. No problem at all. Okay, David. Hi, Phil. Uh, I've been using extra acrylics because I love the colours, but the only way I get them to behave uh, with my HPCH is to really thin them with X20A, uh, about seven parts thinners to three parts, uh, which I know is thin. Uh, this seems a lot uh, of advantages with this paint. Less ridge lines, uh, less clogs, extra acrylics behave uh, easier, uh, sorry, and it's easier to clean. Again, extra acrylics, really love-hate relationship with their paint. Love the colours. I love the first time when I opened the bottle. Come back to use that bottle a couple of months later. It's horrible, purely because it has a skin. You get that big skin around the top. If that gets near your airbrush and down inside it, it's good night. You spend your week cleaning it out, trying to get it sorted. But from my point of view, it's all about, you know, just having that thing where you have your paint, you tip it in, you can spray it, you can use it, okay? If you've got great results with it and it's working for you, then absolutely stick with it. I love their color range as well. They've got an absolutely great color range. Uh, disadvantages of using really thin paint is it costs more. I don't know, you know, you're thinning it. Thin is the cheap bit, really. Uh, right, Tony Evans. Hi, Phil. I hope you can talk about spraying Mr. Color buffable metallics. To be honest, we're going to do one all about metallics, so I'll save it for that one. But yeah, just spray it neat. It's thin stuff. Just spray it neat. We've done it in all the videos, and then you buff it. It is as simple as. Also, in the tutorial section, have a look under the uh, natural metal finishes in there, uh, and there's an entire thing all about the buffable ones in there as well. But we will come back to metallics in a few weeks, and that's all we're going to do. We're going to do the Vallejo, the AK Interactive stuff, uh, the MRP, and then some clouds as well, and do a similar thing with those and show the differences between those. Uh, Jason says, uh, this is some sort of dumb question, no such thing. Uh, I noticed that your pots uh, of Tamiya paints have a warning label on the lid. Uh, this is different type of Tamiya brand paints. I use the same paint here in Canada, but we don't have the warning labels. Also, you mentioned about RLM uh, with the paints. What is RLM? Oh God, I can never remember what they call it. Uh, uh, are the MRP branded paints just in the UK? Uh, several hobby shops I have here have never heard of them. Uh, might they go uh, by a different name here in Toronto? Uh, right, okay, first up, the labelling is purely, it's an EU thing, because I've got lots of them don't. Um, but the newer ones do. Uh, it's just an EU warning thing. I think everywhere in the EU has to have them. Um, Actually, these are all just in English, it looks like. But basically, it's just a help and warning safety thing. What happened was, Tamiya got in lots of trouble. Well, they didn't so much, but they didn't think clearly. Uh, when the new regulations came in about health and safety, about paints and solvents, which came in, I think it was in 2010, if I remember rightly, um, Tamiya didn't have any warning labels on. And that's why you couldn't get Tamiya paints, the buffable, uh, the metal ones. You couldn't get thinners or anything in the UK or in the EU for a good year. Um, uh, that was purely because they forgot to change their labelling in line with EU laws. They quickly did, but it took a while to get back in here, and they have to have them passed. You can't just stick a label on and away you go. You have to go and send it away, and they say that's fine, and then you can do it. So uh, that's what took a little bit of time sorting all of that one out. But yeah, they are exactly the same. Uh, right, RLM, it stands for, um, it's the R German Colour Code System, but I can't remember what RLM stands for. I'm sure somebody in the chat will shout out in a minute. 
Um, but uh, yeah, if they, uh, somebody in the chat knows what RLM stand for, but basically it's a bit like FS, Federal Standard um, Numbers, and BS, as in British Standard Color Codes, uh, and things like that, so it's the same thing. MRP, they're quite a newish company. They're not really, but they've only really found their feet and gone global in the last sort of 12 months, two years. Um, they're quite popular now in the UK. There's a couple of stockists, um, obviously around Europe. I don't think it's probably made it as far as Canada yet. I think there's a couple of places in the States that do it. Uh, but again, if you have a look at the actual MRP website, it has a list of all the uh, worldwide stockists, uh, and perhaps you can get your nearest one to you, which will help with shipping costs. But going direct isn't a problem either, because to be honest, their shipping costs aren't too bad, because it has to go by special parcel purely because of um, obviously flammable items and things like that. Uh, Phil, sorry to be greedy to ask two questions. Not at all, David. Uh, what is the precise modeling? Uh, sorry, I was practicing modeling on my buster and attempted it on the left wing. Do you know what happened? Okay, so looking at your one there, it looks like you've just got too much air, too thin paint. Okay, so knock your air pressure back and see how close you can get, all right? It's really speckly around the outsides, so the chances are you just need to work on your mixture a little bit. What you probably wanna do is, obviously that first ones where you've done and they've been sort of okay but fuzzy around the outsides, chances are you're just too far away. You wanna move in a little bit closer. The trouble is when you get too close, that air will give you the crater effect or that canal effect when you're doing a line. So what you need to do is knock the air pressure back. It's just finding the sweet spot, like we were doing tonight with all the different paints. You find the sweet spot, which gives you the best paint. Then that way, when you use it again, it will be fine. And it doesn't matter if you're doing a block area or camo or mottling, you'll have that same sort of ratios and percentages and various bits and pieces. And when you know it, you feel it. As I was saying, we talked about it last week, he'll start in a car and a manual car. You know, you've got the clutch, you've got the handbrake, you've got the throttle. All three have to come together at, right at that moment. And in our case, is when the paint flows, because if they're not, you're going to end up with a mess. Okay, so from that point of view, it's just finding that sweet spot with all three of them. Right, okay. Ben has put up a thing uh, from the um, Wikipedia of the Military of Aviation. And I can't pronounce that. Okay. <laughs> yeah, well, there we go. It's some German name and it's like Rixlufenwov, but the abbreviation is RLM. That's what it is. And it's the period in Nazi Germany between 1933 and 1944 uh, and all the rest of it. Thank you, Ben. Great job on that one. Okay, uh, right, if I just pop back a little bit and then we can do some of the old ones in here. Uh, right, okay, so I'll tell you what's easier. Guys in the chat, if you've got any questions, shout them out now and I'll answer them now. Uh, and we can work our way through. Yeah, there we go. So Neil's put up there, the Rick and Okay, <laughs> we're all more educated. Airbrushing camo. Uh, is also a must. Uh, right, hold on, I'm trying to read these somewhat backwards. Brushing uh, uh, small detail parts. Uh, yeah, okay, so it's probably easier. Guys in the chat, if you have got a question, ask it again and it saves me going back and scrolling. Okay. No questions. Okay. Oh, yeah. Uh, since the RLM reference on vehicles, so I wonder how the aviation ministry got involved with the tanks. There's the two versions of it, isn't it? There's RLM and RML, whatever it is. Uh, yeah, is it RML and RLM? That's the differences between the two. Uh, okay, so Neil says, when do you decide whether to use an airbrush or a paintbrush? I tend to paintbrush small fiddly parts. Um, yeah, I tend to treat airbrushing as an overall. Uh, so from that point of view, if you're airbrushing anything, um, you know, uh, that can be done, I will. So from that point of view, like cockpits, things like that, our uh, airbrush, obviously all the big base colors, uh, get them all sorted. And then once I've got those sorted, look enamel thinners doesn't shift anything but enamels <laughs> as I'm now finding out okay but yeah it is that thing so if I'm doing a cockpit for instance 
I will build it pretty much as a whole as much as I can, put that bigger base color right the way over it, then I'll go through and hand pick out the details. So side panels in black, I might paint those by hand, um, you know, bulkheads, things like that. If I can, I'll go in and paint them by hand, literally right the way through. Very similar way to actually I've done the ME262 because it's all that basic gray inside, get it all painted in there. The slightly different uh, RMMO2 that was done afterwards by hand and just pop around with it and doing it that way. Is Tamiya safe to spray with only a respirator and no boot? Yes. Um, you know, obviously we spoke about it before. If you can, you know, I know it sounds a bit, you know, and I'm not exactly politically correct as everybody knows, and PC and all that, you know, sort of health and safety nonsense. Um, but it is this thing. I know you don't often hear me using it and all the rest of it, but this actually does get quite a good workout. If I'm using rattle can, someone else at that outside, I wear this. Um, again, it's one of those things. This is a 3M, uh, was it the A1 filter system on it, which is 6051. It hasn't got the bigger particle catcher because I just tend to do with nasties, you know, and stuff like that. But again, it's quite comfy. And if I could get away with not sounding like Darth Vader, I'd wear it on when I was doing this tonight because it would have helped a lot. Uh, but from that point of view, it's just one of those things. I think it should be almost, you know, you get your airbrush, you turn your compressor on, put your respirator on if you're spraying. Because honestly, breathing this type of stuff in, you know, some of it, to be honest, like enamel thinners doesn't smell too bad. But when you're airbrushing it, it absolutely stinks. Okay, same with lacquers as well. If you've got lacquers and you just have it, it's not too bad. But as soon as it's like airborne and been atomized, it just hangs in the air for absolutely ever. And that's the point. If you've got a couple of extractors running, it's not so bad, but still leave them running. Don't finish airbrushing and just turn them off. Leave them running for 20 minutes, clear your environment and everything else like that. Otherwise it can cause real problems. Uh, right, uh, RLL is still used today. It stands for, and I can't pronounce it, and I bet nobody else can, that's why you were just all typing it, uh, the Imperial Committee for Technical Delivery Specifications. RLM uh, was the military standard. Ah, wow, see, there we go. See, we know all these things. Uh, right, okay, so, seeing as we haven't got, let me just check in here. No, we're all pretty good in there. Okay. Other things as well, obviously when you're painting, you know, we're doing this deliberately on small little areas. Okay, so you're just trying to do this thing of like maximizing it. The reason I like working on these and the reason I used to be a right martyr when we used to do the two day courses, the first day was always just on these, is to really make everything bigger. Okay, so the thing is, if you're having trouble laying down paint on here, you're going to have a real nightmare doing it on your model because on here you don't need as much control but the difference is doing it on here it makes everything bigger you can literally look at it no problem but if i was doing you know a 70 second spitfire you're not going to be able to see what's going on that's the nice thing about doing these and why i always say if you've got good control down on here and you're putting all these in and everything's fine and you're like yeah no that's working quite well i'm happy of that effect then when you move on to sort of putting it onto your model and stuff like that you really shouldn't have any problems. It's amazing how the enamels are still tacky now, even now. We did that ages ago on that one down there. Okay, but it is this thing. I know a lot of people say, yeah, but squiggly lines. Yeah, but the thing is, if you can actually put down a decent squiggly line, you have the right control. Okay, so, you know, just play with it, have a go with it, see what you can do. It doesn't matter if it's horrible. It's just so you know where you're going wrong and can improve on it. OK, and that's what we're trying to do with all this type of stuff is to get you in a situation where, you know, when you're starting to airbrush, especially if you're new to it, of understanding why it's always speckly. Why can't I get a proper sharp edge line onto it? And it is that thing, distance. OK, I did myself a little thing here. OK, so for instance, if you're spraying, OK, the way I do this is all right. If you want a gloss finish, what you're going to be doing is low air pressure. OK, and in close. But to do low air pressure and be in close, you need quite a thin paint. Okay, so that's the valuable, you know, the variable in amongst it. Okay, but technically, if you want gloss work, you need to be close and low air pressure. All right. If you want a satin, okay, you can do high air pressure. Okay, but you can still be quite close. But because you're high air pressure, you're sort of making a, a drying finish as you're going over it, and it's more texture, gives a bit of rough, and it looks a nice bit of satin. If you want a flat type of finish on there. 
then obviously you go high air pressure and from a good distance. And then that way, as it's laying it down, it's making everything really, really rough. Okay, because it's got time to dry there as you're moving right the way through. The variable though is, is when you're starting to do various things. So if you're doing camo work and you're just doing a grey plane, it doesn't make any difference. You know, you can just chuck paint onto it, it doesn't matter. The bit where you want to start doing camo on a Spitfire and you want to get in there and freehand it on, then you obviously need to think about how it's going to go down, how you're going to do it, how you're going to tackle it, the angles you're coming from as well. So you always want to be shooting to the middle of the paint job, not away from it ever, because otherwise you're just putting overspray over the other colour, okay, and things like that. So it's just that little thing of understanding air pressure, distance, okay, and thinness of the actual paint. Some paints, like MRPs, don't need any thinning, okay? I know people who actually put a few drops of thinners in there to help it out. Personally, that would be too thin for me, but again, it's a personal choice how you get on with it. But if you're using things like the enamels going through on things like that, obviously they've got a slower drying time, you've got more play time with it, in other words. So that means you can put down coat onto it from a little bit further away as you would with an acrylic. An acrylic's gonna be drying by the time it gets there. Enamels, because obviously they're a bit more oil-based, take a lot longer to dry, so you've got a bit more play time, you can move further away, okay? So just understanding the paint you're using. If it's an acrylic, all acrylics roughly do the same thing, okay? But from, you know, the point of view of when you're into enamels, you're slightly shifting it. When you're into lacquers, you're shifting it again. So hopefully you're sort of getting there with uh, all the different ones have it. Very good. Can I put this up on the actual, uh, there we go. See, this is what I have to put up with. <laughs> Yes, there's Daniel. Definitely, you need no another one on the other side. You'll be absolutely fine. Full NBC gear in there. <laughs> Very good. But yeah, it, so again, once you get the hang of it and you're just understanding it, it just makes things a lot easier. But I know people who have been airbrushing literally years and they still don't know why certain things happen. And it's like, you've been doing it for ages. Yeah, we've well, always done it. It's like, well, you don't understand, but that's why it's doing it. It's like, well, no, because no one's ever explained it. And, you know, and that's the point. So sometimes it is that thing. Knowledge is everything. And I still maintain, if I knew half of the failings I was doing when I started out, I would have been a lot easier at airbrush and it would have come a lot more easy to me. But because I didn't know and nobody pointed it out, I lived with those things and just steered away from them and did other things if I could, rather than actually tackling the problem of why it's not. But looking at your paintwork is a great way of sort of evaluating your technique, your paint consistency, your distance and everything else like that. So I think it's a, a really nice one to do. Right, let's have a quick swizz around here. We're all in there. Okay, let me just check. Can we get rid of that one? Uh, we'll just go over to that one. Nope. Where are we? Okay. Okay, Daniel said, oh right, sorry, speech module on the other side. How would I know? That one's from like the 1970s into it. That's not current issue. <laughs> okay, is there a golden rule about what not to thin with what? Uh, I know Vallejo doesn't like lack of thinner, uh, but what about others like MRP? Well, MRP is a lacquer, so you're only going to be able to thin it with lacquer because obviously it's a hot product. So with MRPs, you literally have just got to put, you know, water in, um, lacquer into it. Nothing else will come close to it. All right. Enamels as well. Technically, you, enamels can be thinned with lacquers because it's a hot product. It will go through. And so will Vallejo can be thinned quite successfully with enamel thinners. Uh, which one is Vallejo? This one is Vallejo. Let me just show you down in here. Okay, so you just going to grab a bit. Okay, so down in here we have our this is lacquer thinners. Okay, so you put lacquer thinners into MRP and give them a swizz around. What happens is it will thicken because all the molecules are all binding together. Okay. So this actually goes quite thick, right? Okay, we'll just get some beat into this. And you can see it's starting to thicken up, but, and this is the big but with this, if you keep going, the great thing with lacquers is you can thin anything because it is just that thing of finding the sweet spot 
OK. And there we go. So there we go, that's got a load of lacquers in it. What's that airbrush we were using with? Was this one with acrylics in it? I think so. OK, let's stick some of those in here. Well, still got the grey in here, which is drying out. Okay. So, you can see it's a bit speckly, but that's because I think a lot of this is the airbrush. There we go, it's starting to come through now. And to be honest, I think I've got a bend on this needle because it's um, not shooting straight. But again, you can do it and put it down. It will go. It's just a lot. But you might notice we've got a flat area on this needle. If I pull it down, you can see here it's flat. And then we go across. It's actually got a flat uh, part of the needle to this. But again, it's thickening up very nicely down in here. Okay. But again, it's just one of those things you can, with everything with lacquers, if you keep thinning it enough, it will thin out and you'll be absolutely fine and good to go and everything else like that. Okay, let me put a drop of this in here just to blow this out but in here for instance this is enamels with lacquer going in it nope, that's one brush Try and keep the brushes somewhat localized okay so lacquer thinners into enamels works really really well actually okay so this will be quite thin in here because it's thinned anyway and again that back Okay, you can see it goes through really, really nicely. Well, we can overcut. And the nice, the only one of the nice things with the actual uh, enamels is that you can actually overcoat and melt in. So where we've got our fingerprint down in here, if we just go over this and we flood this on enough, we can actually dissolve stuff that's underneath it, and it will give you a nicer finish. like that. Okay, where acrylics you would struggle because it would pile on top rather than go through. Okay, and that is going to melt in there very, very nicely. But again, you can, you know, varying your trigger pull slowly, slowly, and then you just come through and you'll be good to go, you know, as you make your way through. On these, okay. But again, it's personal things. Some people I know absolutely love using enamels, and that's all they use because they have a you know a very nice uh, you know sort of relation with it. They've been using it a long time, and it grows it great. Personally, for me, it takes too long to dry. I'm just too impatient. I like acrylics because they dry quickly. I like lacquers because they dry almost instantly. Uh, so that's the reason I don't use enamels. But if you're a more of a patient modeler, you've probably got more time and can do that one. Okay, so if lacquer thinners works uh, with everything, why use X20A? Again, it is that thing, yeah, because it smells. Yeah, probably. Or Mel, I'll tell you who said that, Dennis. Uh, right, no. Yeah, the thing is, lacquers are great, but I think they have their place. Um, obviously, I like to use lacquers in guns paints. It gives a beautiful, smooth finish. Tamiya paint as well, it works absolutely beautiful in that as well. It gives a very nice, smooth finish but it stinks and it's a hot product as well so it is one of those things where you know you're cleaning out with it you're blowing it around your environment everything else it's a lot more than obviously if you're blowing through an acrylic and stuff like that uh is lacquer thinner the same as cellulose thinners see this is one of those things that's come up before um and it, i've had two views on this I get people who say cellulose is different because it's a different makeup. And then you get other people say cellulose thinners uh, is the same as lacquer thinners. 
uh, because really there's nothing in it. Apparently there is from a molecular thing. Cellulose thinners works different to um, lacquer thinners. But I'm no beans a paint expert on this one. If somebody is, please feel free to post it up about that one. Um, I've just never uh, studied it that far to know the differences. But they are certain subtle differences between both of them. Uh, but yeah, technically, they both do that thing of, uh, you know, uh, two-pack lacquers, all that hard stuff. Uh, it is the thinner of choice for that one as you're using through those. Uh, any more questions? What time is it? 10 to 5 to 9 to 8 minutes to. Yes, I've set my clock on my computer, so it should be the same as you because we're slightly ahead of you guys. Uh, right, okay, is that about it? So there we go. Well, hopefully, today we've cured the problem about the differences of paints using them and what to look for when you're putting it down to find the right ratios and the right different areas to go through with it. What we're going to do next week is literally going to come in and we're going to paint something, okay, and trying to put into practice what we're sort of showing down in here. So we're going to be showing about painting just generally a wing down on there and then obviously showing going through the motions of doing a little limited camo work on something, okay, poor Buster's going to get a workout, okay, and showing angles, okay, so when you're painting it's not just all about your paint and your spraying, it's physical positioning of your model. So when you're spraying, you're spraying into it. Okay, so you're not spraying over the other parts because overspray is a killer uh, and it causes low ends of trouble and all the rest of it. Also, how you're spraying onto a model with curves and stuff like that is obviously different to this because you need to keep your angles the same as you're working right the way around the model and stuff like that. Okay, so from that point of view, you just want to be into that thing of keeping it in relation to your airbrush as best as you can, 90 degrees all the way as you're going around. So if something like Buster is going to be a tube, you know, you're just trying to keep it in there. But getting into things with wings, if I can find Buster's wings, I might reattach him for it uh, and things like that. So obviously getting in, avoiding vortex rings, if it's there, how to deal with it as you're making your way through the paint and stuff like that. Uh, thank you, Grant. Uh, sorry, Gary. Jerry. Sorry, my eyes. Uh, great show, Phil. High quality, full of content. Neil says, I agree, Jerry. Uh, can see myself re-watching it a few times. Thank you. The thing is, it's... Um, okay, uh, smells. Have you tried uh, airbrush uh, nail polish? Uh, I guess it's lacquer. Uh, car modelers are apparently using it since the 60s. Yes, hands up, I have. Adam's nails? No, it's not. Uh, but I have done it. Yes, I have actually airbrushed nails before for the kids uh, and stuff. And I've used, yeah, I've just thin it. It just, obviously, when we, we're talking, obviously, hobby paints and all the rest of it. But don't forget, this stuff here, which I used on the RV6 and on the, I'm going to grab them. <laughs> uh, these two, which is what we did the Ducati on. Okay, the heady days of doing the Ducati and the Red Bull. So when we were working on these, these are actually uh, touch-up bottles for the one. So this is actually manufacturer code uh, G Ducati, code number 755 Ruby Red. That is Ducati Red. And then in here, we've got the uh, Red Bull uh, Blue Micro, whatever they call it, uh, as well, which is color match. So these are actually car paint. So it's thick, really thick, heavy duty stuff. And normally they're spraying those. It's like 50 PSI. So what we have to do as modelers is take the industrial version of it, thin it down to go through an airbrush. So all I did was, obviously it's a two pack paint, both of these, they actually need a hardener in there. Mix it with that and then thin it. So it's thin enough to go through your airbrush uh, and do it literally like that. But again, it's one of those things. Two pack paint is I think easier to spray than actually it is a normal paint because it's got a hardener in there. You don't get runs with it. So you can flood it and then you know within 20 minutes it's never going to run because it's really hard. So from that point, it's easier to use a two-pack. Downside, stinks, health, not nice, and all the rest of it. So you just have to watch it with that. Uh, right, okay. Uh, what would we use uh, cellulose thinners for uh, enamels? Uh, sorry, Stuart. Uh, what would we use cellulose thinners for enamels? You could do. Yeah. You could, if you wanted to, if you haven't got enamel thinners and you want to thin, um, you know, enamel paints, lacquer thinners or cellulose thinners will, will do the job. It's hot product, it'll melt it. If it melts it, it does it. It's as simple as that. What you want to do is pop it in a little cup to test it. And when you're mixing it, you're looking to see it just melt. 
you don't want any graininess. If you get any type of graininess in there at all, it's not working. You know, so sometimes you might take you know various uh, thinners and stuff. Just test it in a clear glass if you can. Hold it up, look at it, and then just see as it translucents, as it slides down the glass. If there's any grittiness, it ain't cutting it. You need something else in there a little bit more. Uh, I believe cellulose thinners uh, are a blend. Perhaps it is a blend of them that makes use. I use it for cleaning out of the airbrush, gets rid of loads of crap. Um, I use JP cellulose. Again, I know a lot of people use cellulose because it's cheap, you know, so you can go out and buy a five litre can of that last you forever. If you can just decant it in something smaller and clean out your airbrush and do it that way. Uh, it's the same way. We haven't discussed IPA, uh, isopropanol alcohol, which is this stuff. Um, again, I bought this about 10 years ago, and I'm down to that now, so it does last a lifetime. Um, you could use it, it's basically pure alcohol, that was 99.6 if I remember rightly, uh, on there, you get different strengths of it. Um, the only trouble with that is, again, it's evaporation, that stuff is evaporating really quick, it's pure alcohol, okay? So yes, it thins, but it's not working like I think a true thinner is. Um, I, you know, a true thinner is a medium, it carries the paint. That, you're always trying to do is evaporate and get away as fast as it can, which is great if you want your paints to dry really quickly, but if you want a nice smooth finish, it might dry too quick, okay? So certain other manufacturers, which I know, we know that uh, Tamiya and all those, one of the key ingredients is isopropanol alcohol into it, but there's other things in there as well which slow it all down. There's retarders in there, there's you know, obviously various things that make molecules work uh, and break down and stick to whatever they need to, rather than doing other things. Uh, do, do, do. Can be used as a thinner as well. Absolutely, there, yeah, Stuart, do that. Uh, Archie says, I missed the sewing part of the show again. No worries, I'll watch it. Great series, Bill. Thank you. Uh, Matt says, Thanks, Bill. Great show. Can't wait for the styrene sheets to arrive. I tell you, if, if you haven't done it, honestly, just for a giggle, next time you're painting, I know a lot of people never do. Just have a go with it and you'll be amazed at what you'll see. Because when you do this, it's just showing it under an absolute magnifying. It's like somebody blowing it up on a projector on the wall, your work, because it looks at it in such a high detail because you never see the edges. Because if you're spraying it onto a model, it's too fine. You can't physically see it. But when it's on white plastic art just down on here, you can see every imperfection in your painting and your spraying and everything else. And it just exaggerates everything. And that's why I make people do this, because then when next week we move on to using it on Buster and things like that, you never see any of this again. You won't see the trenching. You won't see any of these little things until you get into mottling and the technical side of it, the basic stuffs of it, it just is going to disappear. But hopefully you've got that memory thing of when you can see it on your model, it's like, ah, we need to do this. And that's the whole point of doing this first two, really, on the plastic card and things like that. Uh, <laughs> Daniel, I think you win the best the best respirator competition. Okay, cellulose ingredients: acetone, methanol, methocrylate, meth. What's the hell? Methanol, ethno ketone. Oh right. Okay. So that cellulose is a bit of concoction about everything then. Uh, right. Uh, lacquer is mainly the same stuff uh, in different ratios. Uh, lacquer's ingredients, acetone, methanol, ethanol, ketanone, uh, oh, I can't even pronounce that, hydrocarbons, uh, like torturing, this is getting far too technical now for me. I need a beer. Others such as glyco, <laughs> uh, cellulose, and other alcohols. The wonders of Google. Thank you, Daniel. <laughs> Who needs anything? We've got Google. Um, yeah, the thing is, I know for a fact, um, you know, you can go very easy if you wanted to. You could just do that thing of literally, you know, isopropanol, and that's what you use. And there's people out there who use water, you know, they just use tap water, and that's what I think with, and it works great. Honestly, if it does, brilliant. Knock yourself out. Me, I've never had any success with those two as on their own. That's why I always recommend, especially when you're starting out, just use the actual one. X28, and I, if I'm honest, um, the uh, the low airbrush thinner. If I was on a blindfold test, I wouldn't be able to tell you the difference. Smell-wise, I could, but actually using the stuff, I would never know. If somebody just handed me an airbrush and said, which one's that? I could not tell you at all because they work pretty much identical to each other. I haven't found in one situation where one wouldn't work. 
But that said as well, don't forget, if you ever run out for acrylics of um, any type of airbrush thinner, just use airbrush cleaner. And I've sprayed entire models. In fact, F-18 Hornets, a lot of you know, do their commissions. Many a time I'd run out of thinners, so I'd actually end up using airbrush cleaner because it'll thin it as well. Does it almost as well, not 100% as well, but it's pretty close. It's a really good substitute if you cannot get hold of airbrush thinner uh, for Vallejo's uh, and obviously Tamiya just to use uh, Vallejo airbrush thinner. Works great. Okay, right, that is it for today. Uh, just use the paint manufacturer's thinners for no worries results. Absolutely, Jimmy, absolutely, couldn't agree more. Uh, for acrylics, I'm using a blend of IPA and dihydronate monoxide with a drop of glycine. Crikey, you're all like in a lab out there. It's like <laughs> breaking bad. Definitely. I can imagine all there in your respirators and all the rest of it. It's bad enough when, I must admit, I got asked what I was going to use that for when I bought that one. So it was like, apparently, I didn't realise because I'm very naive, but apparently it's the staple manufacturing crack cocaine. So that's what they asked me for about, and I was quizzed by it as well. Okay, so Stefan's saying, uh, thinner for acrylics, 75% distilled water, 25% IPA, a few drops of flow improver, Retana works great with Tamiya and Tamiya. Again, if it works and you've got a little thing that works for you, absolutely. Um, yeah, but actually, Dennis, no. I have to say, water and distilled water, totally different animals. If you use them in products, um, you know, than you do. <laughs> Trust me, I know a lot. We use it a lot for a certain product we use, and ours is all distilled water because tap water just doesn't cut it. Right, okie dokie. That is it for me then tonight, guys. Thank you very much indeed, everyone, for watching and joining us. It's been a great fun and a laugh and a giggle. Thank you to everybody in the chat room who's joined us as well. And there's too many of you in there to name off because there's loads of you in there at the moment, 33 of you. So uh, thank you for that, everybody. Uh, thanks for the help in the questions and answers as well in the chat, guys. Absolute stars as always. So next week, Buster gets a paint job. So I might actually have to sand him down a bit because he's actually come really covered in zimmer up the tail at some point and everything else. But yeah, Buster will make it look nice again. I don't know what camo he's going to go in, but he's going to go in some form of camo. We'll probably do two. We'll do splinter and show those sides of it and airbrushing and uh, something else on the other side. So there we go. Anyway, thank you very much for joining us, guys. I will see you obviously all tomorrow for the Friday show. Can't believe Friday's come around already. Uh, and then I'm going to have a couple of days off because <laughs> I need it after that. No problem, Jimmy. Lovely. Thank you very much, guys. Right, if I can find the outro button again, I'll hit that. So there we go, guys. Until next week, everybody. Uh, happy modelling, happy airbrushing. Try it on a sheet of plastic, see how you get on. Or if not, I'll catch you all tomorrow on the actual daily vlog. So until tomorrow, guys, happy modelling. Take care. Thank <laughs> you.